Hello, and welcome to another lecture of conformal diagrams in general relativity. Today, we are going to apply what we've learned to the case of Minkowski spacetime. And so we are going to construct the conformal diagram of Minkowski spacetime. Okay, well, I don't think I need to remind you what Minkowski spacetime is, but I, I just write down the line element. Okay, so this is the notation we are going to use when referring to Minkowski space-time, right? And, well, you recognize the Euclidean coordinates. Okay, the thing is that for our purposes, to ne we need to rewrite this in spherical coordinates, okay? I don't think I need to remind you either about spherical coordinates. So I just write down the line element Okay, and okay, so we have to find a conformal embedding of uh, Minkowski space-time in something bigger. Okay, how are we going to do that? Well, to do that, we are going to perform a number of coordinate transformations to this uh, metric in order to bring it to a convenient form. Okay, so well, this is uh, all very simple. We just have to uh, do a number of changes. Okay, so this is the first coordinate change, which brings the metric into the following form. are all elementary manipulations okay and now well we have written the Lorentzian part of the metric in terms of uh, UV coordinates which are null coordinates and now we are going to do a further transformation on those uh, null coordinates, which is given by the following relation. Okay, now we go from UV coordinates to Psi Chi coordinates, right? And well, just another uh, elementary manipulation. Here it's important to notice that we are doing our coordinate transformations only on the Lorentzian part of the metric. Okay, and now, well, Psi and Chi are still null coordinates. We don't have terms like D Psi square or D Chi square. So we are going to bring this, we are going to transform these Psi and Chi coordinates into 
coordinates which uh, are not null. And we do this transformation. Well, it's uh, also very easy. Okay. And then, well, you have to play a bit with the properties of the trigonometric functions to obti obtain the final result. I'll leave you as next. I leave you that the next size. Well, let me just write down an intermediate step. Last, mm. okay, and so. You need it's in it's in this expression where you have to do some trigonometric uh, transformations, which I'm not going to detail here. They are all elementary, but in order to gain familiarity with these kind of transformations, you should complete the computations yourself. I'm just going to give you the final result, and the final result is the following. Okay, just by comparing the two expressions, I think you may more or less guess what has been done in order to go from here to here, okay? Well, and now the important point is that something remarkable has happened. Okay, well, just remind, remember that we started from uh, Minkowski, written in simple spherical coordinates. We did a number of coordinate transformations whose details are not interested I'm not interested now and we ended up in something which has this uh, form in which we see that well that we we have managed to read to write Minkowski as something which is conformal to uh, another metric okay this is, is conformal to this metric and the remarkable thing is that this is this this metric is the Einstein static universe. Okay, well, well, I think I'm just to, well, I'm just going to write it in words. We can write formula formulas later. So this is corresponds to the Einstein static universe. Okay, so. So this is the line element of the Einstein static universe. Well, I will uh, comment a few. I I'll comment a bit about the Einstein static universe uh, in a moment. But the important point now is that we we can rewrite this uh, expression in the following form. Okay, just. Okay, so so this 
the metric is Minkowski, so I can just write uh, this. Okay, so well, in in our convention, Jimmy New in this lecture, Jimmy New is going to represent Minkowski, and now we see that we have uh, that Minkowski is uh, something one over uh, well. I'm use. I hope you don't uh, confuse this chi with the name of the coordinate chi I used before. And uh, this is just to agree with the notation we used in the previous lecture. And this is can be written in this form, where Jimmy nu is now the metric of the Einstein the static universe. Okay. Right. And okay, why I'm saying that uh, we can do that? Because well, if we uh, we, we we can define a conformal embedding, well, just by 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 looking at this at at, at this expression, we we realize that we can define a conformal embedding of Minkowski of our original metric into the Einstein static universe and we have this uh, function chi as the proportionality factor which we, we, which we correspond to this denominator. Why is that? Well, the thing is that we can give the explicit definition of the conformal embedding In the following way, if we ag well, if we agree that t prime r prime theta prime and phi prime correspond to coordinates on the Einstein static universe, okay, then. It turns out that the map defined in the in the as in in the way okay so this is a map coordinates without prime are coordinates on the Minkowski space-time and co prime coordinates are coordinates on the Einstein static universe, then this map, just move this to the right, okay, this map is a, com is a conformal embedding. And the reason is that well, this reason is just given by looking at this expression. Because now, if we take Einstein's static universe and write it in terms of the prime coordinates, then you can well maybe you can just. Perhaps it's better if I just write it down. Okay. Okay, so this is Einstein static universe, okay? Oh, sorry, maybe I think I need to Now I have to add primes to the coordinates according to our convention. Okay. Square. Okay, so we just uh, 
write uh, Einstein static universe in, in its standard form, but I'm using these prime coordinates. And so if we compute it's the pullback of t mu tilde by means of, of phi of this relation, well, okay, it's obvious that this pullback is just the uh, expression which we have uh, here above, but writing the coordinates without primes, okay? So I'm just uh, delete the primes now. Uh, Okay, and so if we compare this expression with this relation, then we conclude this relation, which proves that this map phi is a conformal embedding, okay? So we are in a situation which was described in the previous lecture. We have a conformal embedding of Minkowski into something which, as we are going to see in a minute, is can be seen as bigger than Minkowski. Or in other words, well, okay, this map is truly an embedding. So it's 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 hap it, it's happening. I mean, I, I have just shown that this is a conformal map just by proving this relation, but now it also turns out that. Uh, this map is an embedding, so we have that it's a proper subset of the Einstein static universe, okay? And indeed, we 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 have that uh, uh, there is uh, an inverse map which go which takes. Uh, this, which takes this set and takes us back into Minkowski space-time, right? So this is all in accordance with what, what, which, what, 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 so this is in accordance with what, what was explained in the first lecture. So we have a conformal embedding of uh, Minkowski into the Einstein static universe. Well, uh, I I didn't. Uh, well, okay. Uh, there's an issue here. I have said that there is an inverse map which uh, does this, uh, but uh, I have not yet proved quite. I have not yet proven this. But anyway, but okay. This 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 can this will come uh, in a moment in a moment, or. So okay, so so let me just uh, okay. So we are here. So let, let us just, in order uh, to see this, let us, we we need to to remember uh, the structure of Einstein static universe. Okay, so mm, okay, mm, yeah. Well, what is Well, in fact, well, it, it's evident from 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 this expression. I mean, we, because well, since we have the explicit expression of the conformal embedding, it's clear that this relation can be inverted. Okay, so we have this relation, and well, it's obvious what the inverse of this is. The only issue here is that, well, let me just write first and speak later. Okay. Okay, so so it's, it's if this is the, uh, the 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 inverse of the of, of phi is is clear, but I I'm going to use a different uh, 
symbol for it i'm going to put the bar because well because we need to uh, b because th this is uh, phi is acting on the whole of l i mean the domain of phi is l but the image of phi is not the whole of einstein static universe it's as only a subset of it so that's why i'm using here the bar and well the you will see in a minute why i'm saying that the image of phi is a subset of the einstein static universe and to see that well we need to follow what we explained in the first lecture and we need to study the zero set of chi okay why well because well if you remember from the from the first lecture uh we said that uh this set is obtained by computing or what well, better just to follow the notation of the first lecture such that And well, well, this chi bar is obtained from chi, and and uh, and the point is that well, we are going to see that in this case, this is not the empty set, because if it was the empty set, then it could happen that this inclusion would be an inequality. But since this is not the empty set, as we are going to see, we will be able to see that this is just an inclusion well i think this all will become clear when we do the explicit computation so don't worry if, if right now you don't there's you don't quite understand it just let me continue a bit so but okay so how how do we compute chi tilde well this is uh, the composition of chi with uh phi bar minus one which we know we, we all ha we have uh that okay so we have five so okay and we also have the expression of of chi the expression of chi is just uh uh we, we just have, have to compare these two expressions right and we have to uh we have to take this uh we we know mm, the explicit expression of the pullback of g tilde mu nu so we just uh replace this here and compare and we realize immediately that chi is just the denominator uh, of this quotient and we have here the uh, inverse of uh uh, phi bar minus one so we do just we do the composition and we obtain uh, the obvious result okay okay and so we need to find uh the set of zeros uh, of this chi tilde function okay so now remember the type t prime and r prime live in einstein static universe so this is going to be a subset of the einstein static universe okay since uh, this expression only involves two coordinates then we, we can just restrict our study to the uh to two dimensions spanned by the pla by the plane t and r so okay it's easier just perhaps to draw a picture sorry let me just draw the line straight okay okay so we have this 
we have this okay let us assume that this is t um right mm, okay yeah it was okay and so right we need to see what this condition entails okay okay this is very easy to find so well just write the result here and well we have actually two sets of uh, solutions okay and and prime um, are just integer numbers right okay so these are uh straight li lines okay i'm just going to draw this set of strat of, of straight lines in the diagram i'm just sorry let me just move the Okay, just take first the diagram and then the prime, prime later. Okay, so we have a uh, well, sorry, I just want to draw it in red. Just okay, so we have. And well, okay, I just draw four lines, but well, you realize that there, there is in fact an infinite number of lines here, okay? And well, let me just indicate which line is which. Okay, and at this point, we need to remember that the, the, the ranges of the coordinates, of the prime coordinates, because, well, if we, go, we just go back and we look at the uh, lined element of uh, Einstein's static universe, then, okay, this, uh, well, there is a part of the lined element which corresponds to the three sphere, so it means that uh, the range of r prime is this okay because it corresponds to the um, polar angle well one of the polar angles of the three sphere so it means that in if we look at this uh, at, uh, this picture we only need to cons we, we don't need to consider the whole two plane we just need to consider part of it, which I am going to indicate now. Okay, well, didn't get a straight line, but well, yeah. just let me just get a nice picture. Okay, right now we have a so uh, it means that we only have to uh, consider the region with blue lines okay right and within this region we need to consider an open set bounded by the uh, lines which are defined by this condition and well if you just look at this region you see that there are an infinite number of open sets which satisfy this property for example i'm going to uh indicate one of those open sets with uh the well, with with green lines okay this this open set 
uh, is bounded by uh, well by these two lines which satisfy this condition and well and also this vertical line which uh, is the boundary of the coordinate range and but I mean I could have chosen any other any of the other infinite sets which we have here okay and in fact for our analysis this couldn't have mattered but uh, I am just forced to, to to pick one open set it's because uh, this open set is going to correspond to the image of our well, let me just use the right co color this this open set is going to correspond to the image of our conformal embedding okay so i just have to because otherwise if if i if i choose an, inf an, an if i choose more than one open set i i what what happens is that uh the embedding the map is no longer an embedding because the we don't we we no longer have an inverse so that's why we are forced to choose one set and so i i am just choosing this set just for simplicity but i could have chosen any other set and so this open set here will correspond to the image under our conformal embedding okay i can just well, okay let me just be smaller and yeah i indicate it in that fashion and well to make things even more clear let me just uh well uh draw the th this open set separately so i'm just uh draw again mm, sorry Okay, I draw again the diagram. Okay, but now I'm just putting uh, only uh, the open set which, which we have chosen. Okay, and well, just write the. Okay. And yeah, okay. And so this is uh, now the image of our conformal embedding. And yeah, the point now is that well, uh, I, I, I w since mm, this this condition only involves two coordinates, uh, we do we did the analysis in in the two. In, in the two plane in, in t prime and r prime but okay this is not two dimensional this is actually four dimensional so we need to think of this condition as a condition in a space of four dimensions not just two and so these uh, sets which we are seeing here as uh, sets in two dimensions are actually sets in four dimensions and so we need to think of, of them as sets in four dimensions and well, this might require a bit of thinking, and mm, so, and but to help us, we we are going to draw uh, a representation of the Einstein static universe in three dimensions, because we we cannot unfortunately, unfortunately I cannot write here in four dimensions. I have to, uh, I can draw at most. Di uh, a two-dimensional representation of something which is three-dimensional so i am going to draw here the standard representation of the einstein static universe as a cylinder which i think you are all familiar with but i might will just remind you the essential details right okay okay here it is let me just rescale this picture for you to see okay right this is the picture right and well 
I think I'm going just to, to put two pic the two pictures together because we need to work. We need to work with both pictures, right? So yeah, I'm just going to take this picture and put it together with the other picture. Okay. Okay. And so, yeah, we have now both both pictures together. And yeah, well, I, rem I remind you, well, maybe I should just rewrite here the metric of the Einstein static universe. Uh, Okay, so this is the metric. Need a bit. Okay, I might need a bit more of space. And well, you remember. Well, I'm just doing a very brief description of the Einstein static universe. You remember that this is the round metric of S3. And so, just by looking at this. Uh, metric we see that the topology of the einstein static universe is uh, s3 cross r right so this is a very brief uh revision of the einstein static universe and that's the reason of the representation as a cylinder, we have here the S3 times uh, R, okay? And so now this, uh, the, but, but okay, we, we're, we, in this case, we don't need the whole Einstein static universe. We only need a subset of it, which corresponds to the image under our conformal embedding, right? And this image is given by the interior of this sort of triangle, right? If you remember from what was explained before. So we need to sort of take this uh, triangle, which is a two dimensional representation of, of this set and try to figure out what what this looks like in the when, when, when it's in the cylinder, okay? Uh, yeah, well, we should remember that in, in this two dimensional representation, uh, each uh, point Uh, will correspond to uh, to a circle. Well, it, it it corresponds to a circle in the well. It corresponds to a S two on the on the three sphere. Uh, well, okay. It, this takes a bit of a thinking, but. Mm, Well, I think that mm, perhaps the best is that, is that uh, I give you the result and then we discuss it later. So, 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 okay. So we have to put this in here, and the result when to, to you do that is well is given by another picture, which well is can be. Has, can be found in number of textbooks. I have, okay, so I'm just going to put it again because I need to rescale the picture. Okay, so yeah, need a bit more of rescaling. Okay, so I took the, this picture from the book of Hawking and Ellis, which I mentioned it at the, at the in, in, in the first lecture well, in the introduction to these lectures so well if you uh, if you represent this set on the Einstein static cylinder sorry on the Einstein universe what you get is this picture where this region with the vertical lines correspond to the 
set we we are representing okay so this is just phi l well this this takes a bit of thinking to to to, to find out why but well it's clear that uh I'm, I'm going to just bring again this with me because i just want to have it together next to the picture of the cylinder okay yes right and so in, in the if, if you look at this picture this this uh well uh this line goes to uh this uh two lines this is t equal to r plus pi and this uh the, these two lines uh below go to uh correspond to this okay uh okay how can i I, I cannot I can only draw in two dimensions I cannot draw in three dimensions but I think that you will be able to figure out what I am saying okay and then we have this uh, vertical line which corresponds to this uh, axis okay so this uh, okay this is uh, mm, t prime well this is r prime equal to zero and this corresponds to uh, mm, no, this corresponds to r prime equal to zero. Okay. So mm, yeah, so 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 we have achieved uh, a conformal uh, embedding. Well, uh, and, and and now we, we just by, by by looking at this uh, by by doing this analysis with, with these two pictures, we we, we clearly see that uh, the image is just is a proper subset of the Einstein static universe. It's not uh, the whole the, the image is not the whole uh, Einstein static universe. It's just a proper subset. Okay. So we truly have, uh, well, if we combine this with what with, with I have said before, we truly see that this phi is a, a conformal embedding. And so we are uh, getting a conformal, uh, conformal embedding of the Min Minkowski space-time into the Einstein uh, universe, okay? And we also have an explicit form of the of 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 um, an explicit representation of this set okay the boundary of the conformal boundary and yeah you see that the conformal boundary is just the well can be seen here as the in in the in the in the two pictures is the union of a number of of subsets t equal r plus pi equal r minus pi okay and then we have a number of points as well which i which are here which are also represented here which are uh what the so-called i naught i minus and i plus which i also write here okay well uh, i naught plus and i minus Okay, so this is the uh, representation. And uh, well, the thing is that each of these regions have name. Well, I have already given the names of the points, but these sets also have names, which are uh, the so-called uh, future now infinity, past now infinity, and the points. Uh, well, the name now comes because this is this this well if you look at the mm, well maybe this is better seen in the, in the two-dimensional diagram these are now hypersurfaces on uh, the Einstein static universe well because 
Well, you have to bear in mind that mm, null rays here. Well, this is perhaps better seen in the. If you look at if you if you look at at the two-dimensional part of the uh, Einstein static universe, it's easy it's easy for you to figure out what null rays look like. And in the, well, in the if you look here in the two-dimensional uh, diagram, we see that null rays are just lines with a slope of 45 degrees. And since this uh, lines have that slope then we deduce that they are they correspond to null uh, sets on the Einstein static universe so that's why I'm saying that these are null hypersurfaces and this is one uh, point and the other point is the topology of of, of these sets well uh perhaps the uh easiest is just to uh look at this uh representation and if you look at this representation it's uh and you remember that this is one of this r corresponds to one of the polar coordinates on s3 then it's easy to figure out the topology of each of the sets okay so mm, yeah so yeah, if, if we define S star three as S three minus the North Pole, then, uh, so it's just S three, which we have to, and in which we have taken away the poles. Then we deduce that <clears throat> we deduce And also we have that uh, well just have a look at, at, at this picture and remember that uh, future null infinity correspond, corresponds to this line plus this line but well this line is just mm, isomorph is just hom homeomorphic to the circle but with with two points taken away which are i plus and this uh, i not which is here okay so e with that in mind it's easy to realize that future null infinity is uh topologically this set and something similar happens for past null infinity and the other sets uh, i not i plus and i minus are just points well just look again at the tire at, at this picture and you you realize that this course they correspond to points on s3 okay and actually uh yeah just by by looking at the values of the of the uh, polar angle, you deduce that they correspond. Uh, uh, I plus and I minus are points on the uh, north pole of S three, and I not uh, is a point on the south pole. It corresponds to the south pole. Okay, so we have uh, given a complete represent description of the conformal boundary of this uh, of the conformal embedding defined by phi okay but what does this description tells us about mm, the global structure of minkowski spacetime 
Okay, let us answer to that question. And for answering to that question, we are going to look again at this two dimensional representation because uh, what comes next is better seen by looking at the two dimensional representation. Okay, so I'm going to just take again this picture and draw it here a bit bigger. Okay, so yeah, let us just clear our space and do again some pictures. Okay, so I take this. Uh, just just how. Okay. Right. And well, I, I'm just going to draw uh, to indicate the points the, of the boundary, the, the regions of the boundary which we have just discussed. I plus, I minus future now infinity this is i not um this is uh, past now infinity okay so well uh there's an, an important thing which i forgot to mention let me just briefly go back to to the three-dimensional representation and the point is that uh well just combining the results about the topology of of the of of this set okay which you see and uh the result which tells us where which what is this this uh, the image of the conformal embedding we we can we deduce okay i'm not this is not a formal proof but uh you 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 it's it, it, well it's intuitive from from the picture that uh, the closure of the image of the embedding is a compact set. Right? So the, what, what it, this tells us is that this embedding is, well, it's a, it, it, the, well, it, well, this is a, it, it's a conformal embedding, but uh, since the image is compact, we say that mm, we have constructed, we have achieved a conformal compactification of Minkowski space time. Okay, and this will be true of uh, of the remaining examples which we studied in these lectures. Okay, so well, th th this is a conformal uh, compactification. It's also seen here in, in this uh, two-dimensional picture. Well, the picture represents a compact set and yeah so this is one thing which uh, it's important so so that's the reason behind the terminology of conformal compactification and well it's important because we we we, we are able to represent something infinite like um, minkowski space time as something com uh, f finite which is uh, a compact set okay so so here oh, sorry here we have that <coughs> uh, we have that the interior of this triangle is a representation of Minkowski space-time that's an important idea another important idea of this uh, picture is that light rays uh, are lines with slope of 45 degrees okay so i can just draw the congruence of uh light rays as sorry well maybe i can just do it this a bit clearer just with a thinner pen okay so these are light rays which have uh, all a uh, slope of 45 degrees okay well let me just do the picture a bit better sorry I, mm. okay all 
Right, okay, I think you more or less uh, understand what I mean. Uh, but why is that so? Well, again, this is because, well, th the reason is what I explained before, is because, well, since this is uh, a subset of, of the Einstein static universe, and we know that what the light rays of Einstein static universe look like, then it's just we just need to make a projection, and the result of that projection is this picture. Okay. Uh, and well, the relevance of that is that it's very easy in uh, to, to draw in this picture coastal curves uh, in Minkowski. Okay. So we just have to keep uh, the uh, curves within uh, two light rays, okay? So for example, I can just, this will correspond to uh, a causal curve. And suppose that you want to study inextendable causal curves. Well, I remind you that a causal curve is inextendable if it's not a proper subset of any other causal curve, okay? So, uh, well, this is true of, So, well, let me just put this below uh, yeah. and take in I not back. And so, for example, this is a causal curve, but it's not it's extendable because we I can just uh, extend it and put it con put it as a subset of any uh, of other causal curve. The point is that. In this picture, we see that there are two, well, an, an, <coughs> an extendable causal curve in this picture is going to be a curve which uh, reaches the the, uh, the boundary, the conformal boundary. And, well, there are two possible ways to reach the conformal boundary. I can just get to uh, future now infinity, or I can get to uh, I plus or I minus. Okay, so if I have another curve here, you can just let it go. Well, sorry, I'm just going to use uh, the thin uh, pen. You can just let it go and it can reach uh, I plus or it can reach I minus. Uh, by the way, uh, this is, uh, well, if we, we, if, if we go back to the uh, uh, three-dimensional representation, well, th this vertical line corresponds to this vertical line. This is not part of uh, of the conformal boundary. Well, maybe it, this is not clear on the on the two-dimensional representation, but it's clear in the three-dimensional representation, okay? So, so, let me just, so, this, I just, this uh, set of, of the which is on the boundary of this triangle, is not part of the conformal boundary. This is important. Okay. So, so it makes no sense to say that, uh, and what well, if we have a, 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 a coastal curve which ends up in the, in this set is not uh, it, it is not inextendable because it's be because inextendable curves in this picture must end must have endpoints on the conformal boundary so so if i if i draw this uh, curve i cannot say that it's an uh, inextendable curve okay so inextendable curves have to end up at the conformal boundary which is consists of uh, future null infinity, past null infinity, I naught, or I plus and I minus. 
And another thing which we can see here is that, uh, well, it's not possible for a costal curve to end up on I naught because it is the curve cannot be costal. Okay, so if I draw this, I can see that at some point the curve will become uh, spade like. So, uh, I, uh, costal curves, in extensible costal curves, cannot reach I naught. That's why I naught is called uh, space like infinity. It's also called space like infinity. And since I plus and I minus can be read by uh, costal inextendable curves, well, indeed by uh, time like inextendable curves, they are called time like future time like infinity and past time like infinity. In fact, there are two types of inextendable causal curves. There, th there are those curves which uh, reach uh, future null infinity. What well, there are just curves which, wh whose endpoints are, are future or past null infinity, and there are those curves whose endpoints are at i plus or i minus. Okay, so we can distinguish two families of curves. And well, the question here might be well wh wh why are you putting where why are you taking these points as separate points why, why don't include this i plus or i minus as part of the uh, uh null uh conformal boundary okay well maybe if we go back to the 3d representation well, okay you, you, you I could have we could have included uh, i plus and i minus as as, as part of, of the uh, future null infinity and past null infinity. Well, okay, the the answer to that question uh, somehow can be guessed if we look at the diagram because we see that the, uh, at these two points uh, uh, the conform the conf the hypersurfaces which uh, f which form the conformal boundary are not smooth so so somehow mm, they, they, they must have some kind of uh, special property and for that reason we we are keeping it we are keeping them as separate points and, and the same is true of of, of i naught okay so so that's uh, one of the the reasons why uh, well this is not ap appreciated in in the two-dimensional picture because okay we, we are um, uh, in the two-dimensional picture the separation of i plus and i minus looks a bit artificial uh but uh, in the 3d uh picture this separation is no longer artificial the, the separation uh, of i naught is here in this two-dimensional diagram is more natural because here we see that this is uh the conformal boundary is not smooth so uh yeah so that's the the point uh but well this, this, this is one of the reasons but the other reason is that in extensible curves whose uh, endpoints are at i plus or i minus are curves such that mm, well are curves which satisfy um, an, int an interesting property and are curves which don't have particle horizon Okay, so so what does what does does this it mean? It means the following. Take a curve such that is an inextendable causal curve such that its endpoints on the in the conformal boundary are i plus and i minus. If we consider such a curve, 
and we compute the points such that can be influenced uh, by the curve at any time of its history, then we come to the conclusion that those points are the whole Minkowski space-time. Okay, so namely, we just have mm, Okay, so we have this, and then the result is that this is the result. Uh, okay, what what this i plus minus means? Well, I remind you that uh, if you have a, a set. Just want to write it. Well, maybe just one of them first. So we can join uh, P with a time like curve which starts at some point of uh, gamma and ends at P. So if you look at here at, the, at this uh, picture, you, you just consider this, this curve, okay? Consider now this curve gamma, then uh, and just mm, consider uh, any point uh, on 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 here on Minkowski, which is, as we know is the interior of this triangle, then it's always possible to find a point within uh, gamma such that, uh, for example, uh, this one such that we can join uh, this point Q with uh, with P by means of a time-like curve. Okay. Let's call it comma prime, and this is true for any point of of here of the triangle. It's easy to see that in this picture. So we come to the conclusion that uh, for this sort of curve, uh, I uh, I well, this is the so-called chronological future. I, I forgot to mention uh, forgot to mention this. This is the. Okay, so yeah, we have this uh, interesting property also with the chronological past. Which is, if we consider a curve which has an endpoint at the at in future null infinity or past null infinity, this is not true. So let us just, for example, uh, take uh, yeah, for example, we take uh, we take uh, this curve. This this curve here. Let us call it. Um, let's call it what. Mm. Let us call this curve. Uh, uh, Kamma tilde. Okay. So, if we compute the chronological, uh, uh, for example, the chronological past of this curve Kamma tilde, well, it's uh, in 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 this picture is easy to to see what this chronological uh, past is, well, it's just, uh, well, which, which color should I use? Well, maybe this one. Okay, so is this uh, region, okay, so, so, so you have to consider the set of uh, points such that we can join those points with a time-like curve which starts at Cam Matilda, okay? Uh, well, uh, with that, well, no, it's, it's the other way around. So we need to consider uh, 
all the points which can be joined uh, from Camp Matilda with that pass time like curve. Mm, yeah, maybe for example, yeah, take uh, this point, uh, P tilde, then there is a past directed time like curve, which from a point of Camp Matilda to P tilde. But if we, you take a point here, you cannot find a past directed uh, time like curve from Gamma Tilda to this point. There is no way of doing that. Okay. Uh, so, so it means that uh, for Gamma Tilda, we have the property that. Uh, is not the whole L. And something similar happens for the chronological future. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry. I need to take some this way. So it turns out that When this happens, we say that Camp Matilda, uh, the curve Camp Matilda has a particle horizon. Okay, well, maybe. Uh, well, I'm just going to take this away and. Cause I, okay, so I'm just putting this here. Yeah, and so. Okay, so and, and and we have just come came up with this property. We have shown these properties uh, with the just by looking at, at at the diagram. If we have tried to study those properties with the standard representation of Minkowski without without using this diagram, then it could have been difficult for us to figure out these properties. And, and well, this, these are all properties dealing with, with curves. And well, there's another property with dealing with hypersurfaces, which suppose that uh, I draw ha hypersurfaces, uh, a ha space like hypersurface uh, sigma here. Well, suppose that I, 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 I consider just that this space like hypersurface, right? Then just by looking at the diagram, it's easy to see that any inextendable coastal curve just the regard, doesn't matter where its endpoints are will always have to meet sigma okay there's no way for a curve which uh, is inextendable on coastal to uh, of avoiding meeting sigma because if you you try to avoid meeting sigma then what happens is that you are no longer a coastal curve you be, you become uh, space like at some point right so that's what that's that's what happens and for that reason we say that sigma is a cauchy hypersurface okay so by looking at the diagram we we well it's not a formal proof i mean what these properties which i have mentioned here are no the diagram is not giving you a formal proof but it's giving you a hint that mm, a formal proof is possible and so 
one of these uh, properties is the existence of Cauchy hypersurfaces. And when we have a spacetime which has a Cauchy hypersurface, then this spacetime is called globally hyperbolic. Okay. So we have uh, come across a bunch of interesting properties in Minkowski spacetime by means of uh, studying its uh, conformal uh, compactification, its conformal diagram. Well, th this this uh, picture, which is here, which I which is here, is called the uh, conformal diagram of Minkowski. And since it's two-dimensional, it's also called its Penrose diagram. And well, I have illustrated in this lecture uh, how conformal diagrams are useful to deduce uh, a bunch of interesting properties. And well, we'll in further lectures, we will see other examples in which uh, conformal diagrams enable us to gain a lot of understanding about the global properties of a given space-time. And yeah, for the, uh, an, an, uh, well, uh, another property which I uh, which I have to mention regarding this this picture is its shape, because at the beginning I said that we were uh, that the the, the one of the, well, the, the main idea here was to to try to look at the space time from outside. So, so that's what we are doing here, and by doing that, we we, we can actually uh, see the shape of the space time, and we see just here this triangle shape. In other cases, we will see that uh, the shape is different. It's not a triangle; it's something different, and this uh, difference will uh, also entail differences in the global structure of the space-time. Okay, so that's all uh, for this lecture. See you in this next lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.